Well, hi there. Thanks for finding the Profitable Photographer with Lucy Dumas here on YouTube. If you want more, you can just go to any podcast channel and find the show or go to lucydumascoaching.com, Lucy with an I, to learn more about me and to listen to shows. And thank you for subscribing, sharing with your friends, and I hope you enjoy. Bye for now. Are you wanting to create a highly prosperous photography business doing what you love? Or maybe you have a great business already and want to up your game? Then you're in the right place. Master craftsman photographer Lucy Dumas and her guests are here to support you on your journey. Now here's your hostess and tour guide, Lucy. Hello, 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 everybody. I'm having a good Saturday. I hope whatever day it is for you, you're enjoying yours. Thanks again for joining me or thanks for the first time tuning in to The Profitable Photographer. My goal, if you haven't figured this out, is to help people worldwide have thriving businesses, make great money, serve their clients to the max, and enjoy the good life in general. So hopefully in the 87 plus countries where this has been listened to, things I've said, things my guests have said have supported you and people that you know in achieving those goals. So today I am going to tell stories and hopefully there'll be some lessons in the stories. My editor thought it would be fun. It was his suggestion. And it's because now and then I'll tell a little story in a conversation. And sometimes I I wonder if I should leave that in if it doesn't relate. Anywho, so he was like, why don't you just do a story episode? So that is my plan today, and we'll see what happens. Before I do that, I have two big announcements. Number one, I am offering the first five people that contact me this month, which we're still in October, to have a complimentary strategy session. I call it the Create the Business of Your Dreams session. And if you email me, Lucy at LucyDumas.com, Lucy with an I, as always, or if you go to my website, LucyDumasCoaching.com, you can send me a message there and say, I'd like that session or I'd like to apply or, hey, Lucy, put me in, you know, whatever will get my attention. And uh, we'll set up a little quick chat and see if you um, are ready for that kind of conversation. The person that would be ready would be somebody that's been thinking, you know, I wonder what it would be like to have some one-on-one -on -one conversation with Lucy and possibly hire her as my coach if it feels like a fit. So that's my news. You just need to contact me and then we'll set that up with the time that you and I have available. Okay, number two, do, do, do. big announcement. I am going to start adding these recordings onto my YouTube channel. And the YouTube channel is The Profitable Photographer. And so I'm going to start with some that were super popular in the past, and then we'll be adding as we go. But by the time you listen to this, or at least in the next week or so, I will have added quite a few that if you like to listen on YouTube, instead of wherever you're listening now, you can check in there. So those are my big announcements. And so let's see where we go with stories from my life. <laughs> the theme of this, at least for starting, is kind of a look back into how the career that I've had over the 40 years has been the perfect one for me and signals that if somebody were watching my life would be like, yes, this could be a great career for her. And part of why I'd like to suggest this or tell you some of my stories is because sometimes finding our career path or even our art path or our hobby path can be a little confusing. 
and also helping friends or if you have kids or grandkids um, really being able to support them like i noticed that my great niece is always straightening things up and decorating in really efficient ways and so we've had conversations where i think she could either be an interior decorator or she could be an organizer for people and um she's always been like that so these are some of the things that if if i was my parent <laughs> i would be noticing now there's something that my parents never knew about we'll start with that one and this is the first time i remember making something creative and then selling it and so it's an indication that i'm a natural born salesperson but also that i love uh creating something so i was maybe seven and if you've listened to a lot of episodes you might have heard this but i'm gonna do it again anyway i was allowed to walk around the block as long as i stayed on the sidewalk i lived in a town in central california called Hanford, which is near Visalia and Fresno, Bakersfield, very flat. <laughs> so walking around the block was was easy. And I picked the flowers that were in my neighbor's yards. As a seven or eight year old, I didn't know that people planted those. I thought it was just God <laughs> or Mother Nature, whoever that was. So I picked the flowers and then I went to my room and I made little bouquets and I tied them in ribbons and I walked back around and knocked on doors and sold the flowers back to people. Now, <laughs> I distinctly remember one of the neighbors having a certain smile on her face that when I got home, I realized, oh, those were her flowers. I just sold her. <laughs> so it was like this wake up. But you know, when I think back to it now, I think, yeah, that that shows that um, I was the entrepreneur spirit. Uh, another time I remember, and this didn't go so well, but if I think about it now, I hadn't learned anything about marketing. <laughs> I wanted to sell something and I put a table in my yard and I'd gone through my toys and books and I put them on the table and I put signs and I priced them. My parents wouldn't let me go all the way out to the sidewalk. And of course, nobody bought anything. And I would not go inside unless something was sold. And so I think my parents gave my brother and sister some nickels and they came and bought something now if i'd have been my parent <laughs> i would have said let's advertise this first let's you know knock on doors and tell people you're having a little sale tomorrow between this time and this time make a flyer um make phone calls let the people my dad uh was a pastor of a church no, maybe I could have let people know after church that I was doing it. And I probably would have made some big bucks. So um, I, then this is the first time I've thought about that little aspect. But what it showed me is that I was a kid with determination. And also that I thought selling was a fun way to make a living. My mom was always a natural salesperson too so i did come by that pretty honestly and um that is something i'm super grateful for because i did not grow up with kind of a negative attitude around selling and that it was people trying to take advantage of me or being too pushy things like that so uh okay so natural salesperson creative uh what else I had an experience that uh, happened on vacation that decades later I realized uh, if I were my parent and I had known this story, I would have put a camera in my hand right away. 
we were on vacation in this little park called Nahui Falls on the coast of Central California. And one of the little neighbors we were camping had a camera and, you know, just a point and shoot. And I had a teddy bear. And so we decided we were going to take pictures. And what I did is I thought up a story. And then we went all around the campground and the little dry creek, which there were no falls that day at Nahui Falls. <laughs> so as a family, we called it No Jokey Falls because it was a joke because there were no falls. Anyway, a little family history. Anyway, so we spent the afternoon going all around and I thought I was taking pictures. I loved looking through the lens and I loved the composition and the thought that I could make a little storybook out of it. Now, after we were done, I discovered there was no film in the camera and I would never see those, but I've seen them in my mind's eye and years later, of course, once I got my first, it was just a point and shoot, but I was hooked. Now, I didn't have money to develop a lot. So a roll of film could sit in the camera for six months unless I was at summer camp or something. And then I would do a roll or two of film and use my allowance to process. And I still have some of those fun things that we did as campers and and such. So that was a little clue. Another clue is I've always loved coloring and drawing and storytelling, writing. And so first of all, the story part I think relates to why I loved doing wedding albums and telling the story of the day and why I still love doing albums for families because it's more to me than here's a beautiful piece of art in the home, which if you've listened, you know, I love that. Okay, so here's the next story. And this is about why I decided to photograph weddings as the first uh, 12 years of my career. Now, I've always loved kids, and I'll share a little about some of my kid magnet stories in a sec. But when I was five, my dad officiated the most beautiful wedding that had ever been in our modest church. The family was one of the few that uh, had some big money in the town of Hanford, and it was a late afternoon into the evening wedding and there were candles going up the aisles a million candles it seemed like on the altar the bride had this incredible lacy gown and i remember just ah, in awe and it was every fairy tale come true and from that moment i was hooked on weddings. <laughs> I've often said, um, I'll even cry at cartoon weddings. There is an old cartoon where like a butterfly marries a bee. And I was watching it before I was going to a wedding and I actually got tears in my eyes. <gasps> so kind of a clue that I liked weddings back then. Um, the other part of this story that is a sort of a segue uh is the family gave us an eight by ten of the wedding that was the bride and groom and then my little part of my sister's back on the left and then me running past them with my hair flying with so much joy um, like I said, I think I was five. I think I still had all my teeth. <laughs> and years later, I took a photograph in New York City. It was the first what I considered a, a piece of fine art of a, a 
little girl running back and forth with a giant balloon in front of a building. And I used that for my first business card. I used it for a sign when I did bridal shows. And the sign um, would draw people because it was black and white and it wasn't of a bride. I had other portraits of brides and grooms and weddings for them to view, but it drew people because it was different. And especially, you know, there was maybe only one other woman photographer that would show up at the bridal show. There weren't very many of us back then. And so it was a great marketing tool. Decades later, it dawned on me that that little girl running with the balloon going one way, her feet going the other way, her hair flying, her age, even where the hair clip was, was a picture of me. That was the one from the wedding when I was five. <laughs> and so let's see, somehow I need to let people see those too. So I'll ponder that and see if I can post it on my Facebook before I, um, know that this episode is going to be launched. Anywho, so there just is something about weddings. And even now, <laughs> I watch Say Yes to the Dress because I love seeing brides and I love wedding gowns, especially. I love the flowers at weddings. Uh, so, hey, ooh, and we just went back to that selling flowers thing. Huh, see how it all connects? I want you to start thinking, how does my life connect with what I'm doing now or what I want to do? How could you make like a, a big board like they do when they're trying to solve a case and put strings, you know, pictures or words and see how it all comes together? Because, um, for example, if you've been somebody that always loves animals, rescued them, fixed them up, rescued baby birds, played a dog hospital, um, had that sort of secret touch with them. Now, I like dogs. I'm the official petter of dogs on the corner of Dale and Hawthorne in San Diego. Um, but I've never had one. And I wouldn't start a pet photography business because it isn't my essence. And I love cats, but I would never have a cat photography business because they're they're just too hard. <laughs> anyway, so think on that. Um, think about the people you know who are super successful that um, have a specialty. And I bet if you dig a little bit, you would discover how it all comes together. I did interview, maybe it's been two years, uh, a food photographer, and her name's going to pop in my head um, eventually. But we talked about, because I met her in person at actually a non-photography event, and we were the only photographers there, and we sat next to each other, coincidentally. Um, anyway, she's just always been a foodie. And well, I have two, but I don't need to photograph it. I just, I just want to eat it. <laughs> Anywho, so think on that. All right. So I wanted to tell you about the reason being a kid photographer was ideal for me. Um, now, when I started in business, I, did get that sense that weddings and children were two directions I could choose. I chose weddings to feature because it it was clear to me that it was easier to find wedding couples to pay me. Even I think my first one paid me a hundred, and then the next was four hundred, and it went up from there. But people need a photographer for a wedding, so. I was able to make a full-time living more quickly, I think, because at least for my knowledge of how to do things at the time, I could get those weddings going and get 
get steady money that I could count on in my pocket. But I always had that heart for photographing children. And baby, baby, babies, little ones, newborns. I was one of the first people in San Diego to do newborn photography. Now, I didn't do uh, the style that now has been popular, um, that really was pioneered by Ann Geddes and her work with books and with greeting cards and calendars and things like that. And, you know, big influences from her and the entire newborn community. So I just did what felt right for me. And one day I was holding a baby and I was moving its parts and I was teaching the mother how you hold a baby for photography. And I remembered that my very favorite doll was the type that was the size of a newborn and its arms and legs were attached with fabric. So if you just held the baby and neck too, its neck and its arms and legs would flop. So you had to learn how to hold the head and move the hands and, and different things. And so I know that um, part of why it was easy for me, besides the fact that I babysat a lot and uh, just you know, always love to hold babies and was taught what to do. But I think my first experience with newborns was that little doll. By the way, why do kids like to have dolls that wet themselves? That's still a mystery to me. <laughs> and I was walking by a toy section in Target just a couple days ago, and I heard a baby cry, and I realized it was a doll. <laughs> so, isn't that kind of funny? Like, what the worst parts, the least fun part, which is changing diapers and listening to crying. Um, but babies are perfect, however they are. <laughs> anyway, little little segue on that. Um, so I've always been that person that was the kid magnet, and when I was actually too young to be a babysitter, I babysat. Uh, a child that was maybe nine months old. When I think about it now, I was like 12. And, um, but I was always responsible for my age. So, um, you know, the kid survived. <laughs> but to me, that didn't seem like work to enjoy being with children and getting paid for it. Also, that babysitting experience gave me uh, an opportunity to learn patience because one of my regular clients had a special needs son that was also super, super active. And I spent a lot of time chasing him around or just picking my battles and learning to be comfortable with his energy. So when I've got kids in front of my camera, clients have said to me, oh my gosh, I can't believe how patient you are. The other way I created that patience is I worked in a children's store for two years and that was fun. And I was actually less patient with the parents than with the kids. Um, to me, the kids were, you know, almost every one of them was just a delight to be around. So I, I hope this is either entertaining or giving you some thoughts about, you know, what is natural for you? What would be fun? Like, I could probably do a great job as a sports photographer, but I have zero interest in sports. I could be a great theater or dance performance photographer. Uh, I, I got to um, have a little experience with that when uh, La Jolla Playhouse had a program in the summer for teens and I got to photograph the performances and the rehearsals and things. That was super fun. Um, you know, that was a road not taken. Uh, but, you know, think about uh, what do you love? Do you love cars? Like there's two kind of directions that we can take. So here's a little education beyond a story. We can make money by 
having people hire us directly and photograph them um, on a personal level. Weddings, portraits, engagements, maternity, uh, boudoir, pets, things like that. So that's one direction. The other is for commercial use, and that can be anything. In that category, we'd also say uh, corporate events, advertising, um, fashion, models, things that are about promoting companies and businesses or um, funded by businesses and companies. And I dabbled in all of it at first, trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And then it just seemed the easier route to have somebody pay me. Because honestly, I would rather do anything than spend an afternoon photographing, I don't know, a, a piece of electronic gear. And some people, that's perfect for them. So another thing to look at for yourself, are you somebody that would rather work alone quietly? Do you love the art of lighting things, problem solving, or are you energized around people? And that's, you know, a question or two you can ask yourself to start thinking about either what you're going to do or if what you're doing is bringing you joy right now. I did a trade with um, a company, a, a, a woman that made the most fantastic essential oil lotions. And photographing those bottles and trying to make them look good in a, in a film day, so you couldn't see exactly what you're getting, it was so hard and it was not fun for me. I loved the lotion and I got, you know, I don't know, a dozen bottles of this incredible lotion and some other kinds of things, but it reminded me that's not what I want to do. So you want to think about what do you want to do? What excites you? I know I've said that, but this will come circling around. Okay, a couple other <laughs> stories. And I'm going to segue, and I may segue back, but to how I knew that being a coach, being a mentor, would be the right new path in my life about eight years ago. Uh, how I knew the timing, that's a whole other, a whole other thing. But <laughs> I, first of all, I've always been a leader personality. And if anybody is calling their kids bossy or controlling, I would really love it if you would change your words and say leadership, or you have a leader personality, or some words that are not as loaded that make a person feel like there's something wrong with them. Because the world needs leaders. And those of us that are leader personalities need to learn how to get cooperation, how to inspire, how to do all kinds of things. But we don't need to tamp down and feel bad about the nature that we were born with. So that's just a little Aunt Lucy's uh, <laughs> Aunt Lucy's request to think about how we word things. Um, I have a client who one of her children isn't a go along with the rest of the the family. And what I discovered in photographing her is that like me, she's extremely sensitive. So things that are fine for others could be bothersome or boring or um, just not right for her. And so I helped this client who trusted me a lot begin to look at her daughter in a different way. And I told her that I bet she's going to be the one that grows up to be the most creative and have a career in the arts or something inspiring. And sure enough, all the kids are practically adults now. And um, she is definitely turning into the, the one that is the more artsy 
of the group and dancing to the beat of her own drum. So am I still telling stories or am I getting tangled up in some uh, parenting hot tips? I don't know, whatever it is. Enjoy it, don't, turn me off. Oh, turn me on, wait. <laughs> if you think that's fun, just hang in there. Okay. Who besides Lucille Ball is named Lucy that a lot of people know about? Well, think about Charlie Brown and Lucy. I think her last name is Van Pelt. She had, first of all, dark hair like me, and she had an advice uh, booth. Advice five cents. I think that's what it said. And it's just so funny to me that I am the kind of person that is giving advice even if someone doesn't ask. And one of my careers was working in the airport in mostly my 20s. I had a booth and it was contracted. So it was like my own business. Um, but the contract was canceled. And that's when I started my photography business in 1982. Yikes, that was a long time ago. Anywho, it was travel insurance and currency exchange. And so I would sit there all day and wait for people to come up. And also, especially when San Diego Airport had just one terminal, people on their breaks, people that were what we called ramp rats, which is people that worked on the ramp, putting the bags on and mechanics, um, and then other gate agents and things. When they had their breaks, they might wander uh, through the halls or, you know, get a coffee and stand around. And my booth was always like the Lucy from Charlie Brown advice booth. People just would come by. First of all, I love a good conversation. So that's <laughs> one little key to the podcasting when I thought about whether or not podcasting was right for me, but we'll set that aside. But I've just always been the person that people come to for advice. <laughs> and so here's here's a fun part of my story time. So in those early years when there was one terminal, somebody started a little newsletter and I don't know if it came out weekly or monthly. And so there would be stories about what people are up to and different things. And so I decided to do a humorous advice column. Now, I've always loved humor. And I know probably half a million jokes if, if you could tap into the <laughs> space and handle some of the dirty ones. <sighs> anyway, so I wrote this advice column. And one of the the funnest ones because okay i'll let you on a little secret some of the people that worked there not me um but would smoke a little bit of marijuana on their breaks and then they would use visine uh so their eyes weren't red so <laughs> i wrote um because i wrote almost all of the the Dear Lucy letters. Of course, we called it Dear Lucy. And one of them was about someone that's found they've gotten addicted to Visine. And he said, um, you know, like, help, I am addicted to Visine. Uh, the first time I used it, it was a friend's. They, they handed it to me and I tried a squirt and I liked it. And then I thought I'd keep a bottle at home just for parties or to have for company. And then I started using it every day and I found out or I discovered I had a bottle a day habit. <laughs> what can I do? And so it was, you know, clear eyes, something like that. Your choices are two. You can either go in the murine maintenance program and cut down or you can go cold turkey or cold eyewash <laughs> so that's the only one i remember uh so i'm combining the the person well yeah i guess it's all combined the person giving advice and so that is such a natural fit 
to become an official coach, mentor, uh, because I've always supported others. Even in the course of my career as a photographer, I also was the go-to person where people would ask me for support. Um, and I do, I just love, love, love teaching. Now, I suppose I could have become a teacher, but person with that entrepreneur spirit, I don't think that the actual school system would have been a good fit for me. Another thing I know about myself, and so again, know thyself, is I'm a better chief than an Indian. When I was on my local photography board, I sometimes was a little annoying to the president because I would have ideas and I was throwing them out. And, and I, I will admit I was at times overstepping. But when I became president, I got all kinds of new things going that even now, all these decades later, we still have those in place and they still benefit our local chapter. Now, people have worked hard over those decades to keep them in place and to add and so forth. But whew, I need to take a breath and <laughs> think about all the kinds of things that even have been unpaid, like being on the board, um, being in leadership, supporting other photographers. Let me think. I'm going to pause for a sec, take a drink of water, and look at my notes and see if there's anything else in this story time that might be a practical lesson for you and not just um, get to know me about Lucy. So hold on. Ah, I'm back after a nice cold drink of water. Um, just a reminder before I continue about the opportunity to get a complimentary strategy session that create the business of your dreams session. And all you have to do is email me, lucy at lucydumas.com, or for Facebook friends, which I would love, you can also Facebook message me, uh, not message from the profitable photographer, uh, but the one that's Lucy Dumas, that's the one I see the most. Or go to lucydumascoaching.com and you'll see contact. Okay, meanwhile, back at the ranch. So here is an experience where I learned the hard way early on. And if I can pass this on to you so that you don't make this mistake, my life on earth will be worth it <laughs> because it's painful. One of the challenges when we're new in the business is working with friends or family. Do we charge? Don't we charge? Is there any way they'll respect us as a professional are they thinking this is a hobby for us? So they ask us to do things because we're going to be cheap, they think. So you need to figure out how you're going to price and how you're going to approach people that it can be kind of awkward um, asking them for the money. You need to be really clear and you need it in writing. So the one story that I want to mention is when I photographed a good friend's wedding. It was very casual. It was up on a cliff in um, Point Loma by the Point Loma Lighthouse. And then the reception was probably at their home or like a moose lodge or something. And... I did have professional equipment. I wasn't using a 35 millimeter, I don't believe. And I did a pretty nice job and I think she paid me four or $500. And I put a proof book together and I had an order page. And she'd gotten a little piece of paper that said proofs were $10 and I don't know, eight by tens were 25 or something like that. But she didn't realize that, and she checked off on this proof book all the images that she liked. I thought she was going to pay me for them. So I went ahead 
And okay, error number two, I didn't give her a total and say it's this much. I just expected that when I said, hey, this is going to be $800 or whatever it was for all of the ones that she checked. Um, I think, I don't know, she might have even checked them as five by sevens. But anyway, I didn't look at the order with her, sit down and say, um, it's going to be this much. Also, as you all probably know, I didn't sit down with her and help her order at all, which is what I am a big uh, proponent of right now, so that we both would have been really clear about what we were up to, what was included in her package and what was not. So I ended up making all of those prints before I got a deposit and an invoice for those. And of course, she didn't want to pay what it was I was asking. And I did all of that work and all of that printing. And the worst is the awkwardness between us and the damage to the friendship was super sad. So the lesson is to be super clear about what to expect. I also, I'm not going to go into this, but I had another really sad experience. Anyway, another one similar that was a friend that I was even closer to. So the next friend that was getting married that I volunteered to do the wedding and friend number two, I was doing it for free, but I just asked if they wanted prints that they'd pay me a paltry sum to print and they got upset with that. Anyway, that's that start. Okay, so my friend, Kenny Kugel, I told him I'd love to photograph your wedding. It was a small wedding, but I'm going to give you this. And if you or anyone else wants anything else, it's going to cost this much. And so we were super clear on that. So the lesson in that is be really clear. Be clear with your clients, of course, but be even more clear with friends and family and neighbors because it is so common for people to get upset, hurt feelings, and to lose those people that are close to you. And it isn't good. And also think about it. It's really hard for people to see you as a professional. And so you have to take that position. And if it doesn't work for them, like my, I have a, a sweet, I don't know, she might be a second cousin twice removed, but she's like a cousin. She's getting married in May. And she said she'd love to have me be her photographer. And I priced it at less than I would if it was a regular client, but not super cheap because I wanted to, first of all, because that's what felt good to me. We're not that close that I would do that much work for free. So now I'm going to attend the wedding. I'm going to enjoy it. I will take some photographs that might be better than the person she hires in her price range. I don't know. Um, but we all feel good about it. No hard feelings at all. So the lesson in that is always be clear. Now, my policy with friends and family is it's full price or it's free. And if they're so close to me, like the two friends I mentioned, um, I did them for free. But even free, you need to be clear because I'm not going to print 20 wall portraits for free for people at no cost, not being paid for all the labor involved in all of that. Um, if I do something full price for somebody that I'm friends with or family members, I always bonus them something at the end, something unexpected, like a wall portrait or a couple sets of proofs of everything that they put in their book and ordered or, um, you know, holiday cards or something so that they feel really good and I feel really good. Okie doke. So wedding disasters or potential disasters and how to learn from them. <laughs> One of the things that I 
fortunately learned before this happened is the importance of having backup equipment. And the truth is, something is going to fail. And you never know when it is. And also, it's wise to use that backup equipment for um, some images so that just in case your camera broke and you didn't know it, you've got another uh, something to save you. Also, if there's two slots in your camera, use those both and have each shot you take go into both of those slots so that if one of the memory cars conks out, you've got the other one. And by the way, they do get old and they need reformatting. And if you have any glitch on one, throw it out. Throw it out. Okay. So this one wedding in particular, and it was super nice people where I felt like they were my new best friends. You know how that goes if you've been doing weddings or photographing people in general. And I grabbed my camera and something didn't work. I tried to figure it out and, you know, under pressure, there's like six bridesmaids and six groomsmen and we're out in the field. Uh, no time to fuss with them staring at me. So I grabbed my other camera and it worked. And then something else happened and I ended up changing lenses because the lens wasn't working. I don't remember, but uh, so I had two cameras, but I had three lenses and three flashes. And before we got to the church, I was down to one flash, one camera, and one lens. And it was my 50 millimeter, which is not my favorite for weddings. I like to have a little bit of a longer focal length. And it was medium format, so 50 was pretty wide. But phew, uh, <laughs> right? Now, some of the challenges were simple fixes. Um, the sync cord. If people have been around a while, you know that sync cords can get a little bit bent and then the flash doesn't fire off or then nothing works. So it was a bad sync cord, but I didn't have time under pressure to figure that out. And the couple was super happy. They loved the work. They spent a lot. They hired me later. What would have happened if I had only had one camera? Maybe even lawsuits. We don't want that. So <laughs> now in my nightmares that I sometimes still have about weddings where I show up half dressed or late or something <laughs> and in the nightmare, sometimes I forgot my camera or it isn't working in the dream. I borrow a camera and the truth is most weddings nowadays, probably there's somebody in the audience that uh, has a camera that's worth even more than what you have in the newer model. Um, so it's nice to have some backup equipment like that. And even if I had to finish something with a cell phone, I would do that. But it doesn't make us look very good, right? <laughs> so that, I think it goes beyond a hot tip um, to an imperative. What is it? A something directive. Anywho, have some backups. So that's almost it for now. Um, but I did want to give you a little bit of Aunt Lucy's tips for having a better, gosh, am I talking really slow today? <laughs> Sometimes when I listen to these, I'm like, oh, I should get more energy before I do my solos. Okay, Aunt Lucy's tips for having great sessions. So one of the challenges with children's photography is having them unprepared and having a session go well and then trying to figure out what could I do different right now to make this better. And I learned these, of course, from both babysitting 
and working in a children's store and then photographing kids for, you know, many, many years. So one of the tips is to tell the parents not to bribe the children. Bribery is not relevant when someone shows up with their kids and they're promised a reward if they're good. First of all, all they think about is the reward. Second of all, being good in the, for me, it might be a two hour session, is a, an impossible concept. What does being good mean? Now, I have encouraged bribery in a short term immediate need. Like one of my clients, kid, the kid was from the start, he said, I think this is going to be boring. And I definitely earned, uh, you know, earned my keep with that one because he was pretty rebellious and very active. Uh, and, you know, I, I got it. The clients loved the work. But as we were walking to the car, they walked through this beautiful location where the light was just low enough that we were getting yummy, yummy rim light. And there was still light bouncing on them. And the hills looked beautiful and the trees looked beautiful. So we bribed the kid with two matchstick cars that he could buy either on the way home or the next day, can't remember which, if I could do 12 shots. So that circumstance, I like it. But in the long run, like I had a kid, uh, she was amazing. I think she was only four or five. And she would set up different sets and props, but then she'd only give me one shot and then I'd have to try to get her back like she couldn't hold a pose. She she was super fun, super challenging. But what I noticed is the parents kept upping their bribes. If you do this, then you'll get this. And I swear that girl was going to get a trip to Paris before the session was over. So that's a tip I give my clients. The other is to plan the session so that the children are rested. We've addressed their need for food both beforehand and during the session. They're comfortable, so the clothing isn't too hot, too itchy, too cold. Uh, they're healthy as much as possible. Like sometimes when there's an out-of-town family, we can't do a reshoot. But if a child is not well, um, and we can reschedule, it's to everybody's benefit. They might also be bored, and that is my job to entertain them. Or they might be scared. <laughs> One of my early jobs was working for some photography studios that were uh, in an alliance with each other, and they had a gift certificate program where people could, for, I don't know, $49, get a session in an eight by 10. And I would photograph all the children in the studio because at one of them, this lovely man was tall and heavy with a deep voice and a big beard. And he honestly scared the kids. And so, you know, my job was to take care of the kids, which I got a lot of good experience on somebody else's marketing activity. Anyhow, so scared. Um, bored, not well, hungry, not rested. Also, make sure they don't get vaccines within a week prior to a session because I know when I've gotten my vaccines, I might feel a little not good for a, a couple of days after. And I think I'm missing one more. If it pops in my head, I'll let you know. But when we prepare in advance, that's the thing too. And that's why I like to sit with clients and go through things visually as well as verbally and not just online, um, you know, circle things, make notes, make sure they see these tips. Um, and the other is that I tell the parents, your kids are going to be bratty 
on picture day because there's a lot of stress in the family because you're trying to round everything up and get everybody dressed and ready and in the car. Maybe they're wearing something they don't want to wear, but they've acquiesced. I like that word. So assume that they're going to be, you know, not on their best behavior on the way. But if you yell at them or punish them, and then I've got to get them to look happy, it's setting us up for a very difficult hour before they eventually surrender. And a clear experience I had personally with this is I had a stepson for a while and a step stepdaughter, so the sibling of my husband's son, but not his child. And so we arranged to do some family portraits of the three of them. And so my husband went to get Josh and on the way, I don't know what Josh did, but his dad yelled at him and he probably deserved it. Um, or he, I don't know if he punished, I don't know what it was, but Josh is a very sensitive kid. And honestly, it was an hour before I got a smile out of him. And so when I pass that on to parents, you know, and I'll joke and say, if you want to hang them upside down by the toenails when they get to your house, that's between you and your kids. But pretend everything is okay uh, during, you know, on the way and even during the session that I'm the parent now. And, you know, it's hard for you to know what I need for kids. But first thing I need is for them to be happy. So that is all I have in my little pea brain today. <laughs> and I hope these stories were entertaining and that you also um, got some good thoughts about some different aspects. And there's many more when I think about like, especially as a coach, there's a lot of other incidences where it's clear to me that uh, the stars aligned and this was a good additional career path for me and podcasting. I've got many stories of having conversations on airplanes where people tell me stuff they've never told anybody or, you know, just how much I love learning from people, learning about people. So um, I'd love some hot tips on people you might want me to interview and uh, maybe even send them my way uh, you know, connect the dots. That's it for now. Don't forget, if you want to chat with me about anything, you can um, go to my website and ask me to send you a Zoom link for that. If you want that complimentary deep dive session where we look at your dreams and some of the challenges in the way, and I give you suggestions of what the next step might be. I've got five of those that I can book this month. I can book the initial quick conversation. So that's it for now. And uh, check you guys later. Bye. You have been listening to The Highly Profitable Photographer with Lucy Dumas. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please rate, subscribe, review, and share. To connect one-on-one -on -one and learn more about our coaching programs, just go to lucydumascoaching.com. Until next time, go have fun photographing and selling your work.